Low Cups of yesteryear as we build up to be this Low Cup this weekend. Welcome into the breakdown. Kirsty having a well deserved weekend off, but don't worry, Jeff Wilson is still here, as is Mills Molina. And look who's back! Sir JK, back from uh, 17 weeks sojourn in Europe. Welcome, buona how sera, are you? How was your trip? Buonasera, buonasera. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, hadn't had the family together for six years, so from COVID and a few other things. Um, the wedding was amazing, couldn't have gone better. Your daughter's wedding? Yeah, my daughter's wedding, all the family um, came across, so really beautiful day. Um, you know, my mum always said to me, really, really appreciate and enjoy your kids when they're small, because before you know it, they'll be big and, you know, um, my daughter was in nappies a few days ago and then I was walking her down the aisle, so it was an incredible, you incredible did, time. Incredible you had nothing time. to do with the nappies. Please, stop it. Oh, this nappies, wonderful, really? wonderful photos. That's not fake tan he's wearing. That's <laughs> real sunshine that Sir John goon has been enjoying. I've missed you. KT was great on the other side of the desk, but it wasn't quite the same. I didn't miss you at all, mate. Good to welcome back. Yep. At all. I love you I too, miss mate. you. You're amazing. I would have been Thanks watching you, much. though. What? And what? I'm not happy with with a few of your theories. But anyway, we'll get to that. More Mills. importantly, you, your daughter looked absolutely beautiful. I will make mention of that for a starter. Um, have you had to uh, take out your trousers? Yeah, How well, much eating and drinking <laughs> have you done it? Well conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> well conditioned. Yeah, well I'm, I'm, pleased well don't weigh, I'm pleased they don't weigh the passengers for extra weight. <laughs> only the bags. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was an eat and drink fest, but it was just a beautiful time. So yeah. Mills, Thank you. Yeah, Thank Mills Mills you for covering me. I'm glad to have him back. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, I notice you're fizzing now, eh? So I like that. I'm just going to sit back here and let you guys go for it. <laughs> the rest yeah. of us are going to do nothing. He hasn't had like, put full code chat for, for seven weeks. So why don't we get into it? Well, how good is Bledisloe Cup Week? And I love it. And how good have the All Blacks been playing? Unbelievable. High-risk football, playing to our strengths. Um, you know, it's, it's great being in a foreign country watching the All Blacks with a whole lot of Italians. It was just fantastic. Well, half a tans, Kieran Crowley and Craig Green. <laughs> but um, just just really good style of rugby. I think the, the championship up until now has been great. So we're getting into Bledisloe Cup Week, of course, a big one ahead in Melbourne. And our mate Eddie Jones, well, they're not going so well in the rugby championship so far, but Eddie Jones has been in fine form off the pitch. This is what he had to say last week after that loss to Argentina. Whilst it seems like it's doom and gloom at the moment, it's not, you know, beating inside... Um, here is, is a fair bit of optimism that we'll be able to change fairly quickly in the, in the next couple of weeks. If I was the All Blacks, I'd, be, I'd look out. <laughs> With a twinkle in the eye and a little oh. smirk in the face. Does he believe a word oh, he's saying? Eddie, I love you, mate. That's like, I, I just love you for that. Because for me, Jose Moringo, who was um, Chelsea coach, Man U, he's now in Rome. And that's what he used to do. When the team wasn't going like he wanted, he would deflect. And that's a great skill. And, you know, after South Africa, Eddie has a go at the journalist, you know? What are you talking about, mate? You're like, who are you to say I said that was the B side? And I think that's the beauty of the man, you know? Um, he will deflect pressure off the team. And he's probably pretty genuine. And behind the scenes, he's probably going, you know, we're heading in the right direction. I think he is. I think he's genuine. You know, it'll give his players confidence 
seeing that. Yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. And we've seen, I mean, we've not really seen sort of pictures of the past. There's a lot of history there when it comes to the Bledisloe Cups. And it will take a big effort, though, I must admit. But this game here, Jeff, they had the ability to win that, didn't they? They were one play away from winning this game. Look, they hadn't been great, but they'd shown some really good signs. And look, it was in the last minute. Had they won this game, it's a completely different conversation. So those are the margins that you start talking about. Look, he also did a number of interviews and he talked about the fact that they've got enough things to worry about, not to worry about what other people are doing. So he, he's aware that they've got some issues right now. He's got some issues. And I think there's some things he's having to deal with. He's only really starting to get to know his players, yeah. starting to understand what he's got. He's bringing players in. But you have to love it. The one thing I will say about Australian rugby players, it doesn't take much for them to get confidence back, to believe in themselves. That's just the nature of them. And when they win one game, and it's a critical game, and remembering how close they were last year, they, we got some help from a certain referee that got us across the line, it, it would have been a vastly different competition with Australia. So I, I think we've got to be very wary. We didn't have help team. from the referee. That was like... they. Wasted time took, in the yeah, kick. But anyway, that's what help. happened? That's help, because that's what the first time that's happened in the history of what the game. Happened, what happened to the ghetto law? What's well, gone? So Eddie Jones has just gone, yeah, I'm oh, just going to do wanna, what I want. I want to talk about that. Well, let's have a look. At, at, you, you say he's getting, he's getting to know his players, and he's getting to know them because they're coming from everywhere now. This is the Australian overseas players, or where their players are coming from. Let's have a look at uh, the various locations. So this is the, the starting 15 against the Pumas last week. Couple from France, three from Japan. Yeah, and I, I think this is significant, the fact that they've ditched their eligibility rules and said, these are the guys I want, Mills. But I'm thinking the impact of them coming in, playing in a different competition, playing a different style of rugby, and the fact the guys that tasted success against New Zealand sides in Super Rugby, a lot of them aren't there. And they're guys in key positions. Two locks, plenty of size, and this is the balance of their 23. The Brumbies had six, now they were their best performed Super Rugby team. The Rebels, were terrible, they didn't even make the playoffs, but they've got six Wallabies and you start going, oh, they've got individual talent, well, hold on, winning's a habit. And for a lot of these guys, I don't think they've tasted it, and now he's trying to work out, one, how they want to play, and I'm not sure they've got that quite right. Well, they haven't, but I think he's a lot, well, he is, he's shown that in the past, right? He won't care about, this isn't about winning, you know, the, the championship, okay? Yeah. Perhaps some of it will be about winning the, the Bledisloe. This has got to do with the bigger picture, and that's down the track. And we know they've got a decent decent side of it. All he needs to try and create is that confidence. They, they pick up this one win. On the other side of that, the All Blacks will be wanting to put that Bledisloe away firmly in one game rather than going to Dunedin and thinking, OK, we've got, we've got to win this back because there's a number of players, which we're going to touch on a bit later on, that hasn't seen any Test match footy this year so far. So clever in all, all aspects from Eddie Jones because he's growing that sort of confidence. They're going to get time to gel, especially those players from overseas. It's a different style. No, this is what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it the Josse law instead of the Eddie law. But this is what happened. Hamish McLennan, who's the chairman, said, I want Eddie back. And Eddie would have sat down with him and said, this is what I want. I'm going to pick players from all over the world. You know, these are the rules, these are the reasons I'm coming back and this is what I need. And I don't care, I'm going to pick the best football team. And they would have gone, OK. So I, 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 I think that's rubbish what you just said about the super rugby form, because Australia have never worried about it. They've always, if you have a look well, at Well, they their, should start they worrying should, about it, yeah, because but, their form actually showed they could compete against the Chiefs, who are a yeah, remarkable but, side. They had systems in place and players who were performing, which he's totally ignored. Yeah, but what about the Hollanders? What do you mean? Well, you don't pick All Blacks on the form of their side ever. So the Rebels, if they got six, Eddie would have been looking at the players and going, look, they're good enough to be Wallabies. The trouble, the argument is, should they drop down to four franchises? You know, that's the ongoing argument. Well, they've got argument. no one from the force anyway, so that doesn't yeah, matter. Exactly. So they've got four franchises. But, but I don't think Eddie would ever look at, at a game of rugby, the Rebels versus the force, and go... So you don't believe in combinations. You don't believe in bringing in people who have played together, who understand each other. So when it's instinctive and when you need to make decisions... I you used to. Whether, oh, you, you've gone but away I don't anymore. You don't anymore? No. Just players not, from everywhere. Not if I'm talking from the Australian point of view. Yeah. I, because, yeah. because their talent is scattered so yeah. wide now, and ours is, you know, it's, it's a risk we need to think about moving it's forward. It's a totally different process and format to what we're, we're used to. And, you know, I hope we don't go down that track where we have to bring in overseas players. We don't need to. We've got the luxury of having five great franchises. You know, well, Highlanders are a little bit off this year, but they've got great players in there. It still comes. Competition is good. Eddie's trying to create that. 
you know, get guys from overseas, they've got to get back to winning, you know, winning games. Um, you know, and a big one for him will be, you imagine if they win the Rugby World Cup, how successful that's going to be in terms of bringing more numbers in. They've, they've chased after some rugby league players. They have to go a different way. And this is why Eddie's demands when he first came would have been, I want to open it up for overseas players to come back and play for the world. But is he running out of time? Is he running out of time to find the identity? You, you say, oh, yeah, imagine they've, they, they've got two games to come against an All Blacks team that's going quite well, to be fair. So has he got time with a World Cup less than 50 days away? Yes, they're on a slightly softer side of the draw, you could say, at the World Cup as well, to, to, to find that identity, to figure out what they're trying to do as, as an entire so, union. So in my, in my opinion, he will not... He will, if he wins this week, I don't think he will. I think the All Blacks are in great form. If he does, it'll be an added bonus. Mm -hmm. But Eddie will not be thinking... He will know the draw. He will know he's actually got a little bit more breathing space than the All Blacks have on the other side of the draw. And that's what we talked to, you know, that's, that's, that's what we talked about that draw. So for, for me, it's actually, he will have it all planned out. If you know Eddie Jones, he'll have every second, every minute, everything worked out. <laughs> and he'll want to win this week, but he will have it He's as part of the plan. Coach, well, it doesn't matter what happens anywhere in between. He's got the pressure well like, like, like the All Blacks do to win the Bledisloe Cup. He'll he, he, he want, he want to win it. If he doesn't, no, he's got plenty of time. He's got time to win to win the big one, and that's the, that's the Rugby World Cup. That's his focus. I'm, I'm not doubting the talent and ability of some of these players, but the fact that I think they're coming from around the world, it's the first time they've gone into this space, and they're having to learn very, very quickly, to your point, how to make it work, how to get connected, because these guys haven't been in their environment together for a while. Well, there's another team playing in the Bledisloe Cup as well. We should have a look at the All Blacks too. Obviously, they have been very good in the last couple of weeks. And now, what, two games until that squad is picked, the Bledisloe this week, and then the return match in Dunedin. So who do we need to see? Who hasn't had game time yet within that All Black squad that we want to see named in a side this weekend? You all sort of started to look at each other like you've all got well, very, well, very I have different a, I have a, a voce <laughs> di corridoio. A what? A voce di corridoio, which is whispers in the... Oh, men in the in, field. No, no, whispers in the hallways. So we don't know whether it's really true or not, but I believe that there's a couple of niggly injuries that could keep a couple of players out for six weeks. So Sean Stevenson is still with the All Blacks and we might just see him. We might just see him? Or do you think we'll see him? Well, you'd we'll have to see him, him wouldn't you? Like, do we you've got a couple of niggly injuries that you don't know if the person's going to go to the World Cup, Mills. We have to see people. Maybe it's not this week, but when are you going to see them? When's I think we'll see known? everybody in Dunedin if we win this next weekend. Yeah. We'll see yeah. everybody, but their focus well and truly mills on the back of these two really strong performances will be on Melbourne, and this will be once again, <coughs> and you talk about it, we want to see our guys. We're counting down the... You're not going to see anyone this week. You don't think we'll you don't see... Think... Do you don't think we might see an Anton Leonard brown on the bench? Uh, nah. Mills, for you, do you think we'll see anyone that hasn't been part of these first two I test think matches? The bench will be an interesting makeup because you know the last time they played South Africa, that they didn't have you know um, the big talking point was not having DMAC on the bench and sort of how would that work? I think you won't see too many of this you know uh, against the, the, the Wallabies. I think they'll continue on and try and continue that momentum and you know the confidence within the team. You know, we spoke about the Wallabies, but this is a totally different environment the, and, uh, and, the, and what the All Blacks have had to face considering what's gone on last year. I think you continue that momentum and hence the reason why Eddie saying what he did is massive because the All Blacks will want to win this first game to give guys game time that haven't seen it in Dunedin. Do you need to see Leicester Whainanganuku? Do you Would need like to, to know what he's going to do? Well, here's the thing. Uh, Braden Enon wasn't in the squad, the initial squad, and he's come in as cover for injuries. If, this was, if he's fit and available now, and pretty much plays the exact same position as Mills, JK, as Braden Enorm, surely let's define Manuku's an option off the bench. If you've got any faith in him as a player and trust him to turn the super rugby form apparently, which doesn't mean anything, if, he, if he's going to bring that to the All Black jersey, you have to see him now. We have to see him play this week in a precious situation. Was that, was that a dig, that? that <laughs> it was a dig. It was. You but I said about Australian super rugby. super rugby. Well, they should take stock in it as well. Because if so my through, answer on Leicester is no, he will not play this weekend. So how does he play his way into the World Cup? Is he just going? Well, you've got to realise the pressure on, on Ian Foster and the All Blacks to win all tournaments, right? Don't forget that. As a rugby public, we're very demanding. Yeah. The Bledisloe Cup's not a bonus for the All Blacks. No, no it's it is like a must. It's a must. Right. So like Mills rightly said, we've got all the pressure. So you don't, you're, you're conservative this week. 
and we win the Bledisloe Cup, and then you might see him the following week, and then you start picking for the World Cup Mills, but you can't take any risks. I, I would actually like to see him start, to be totally honest. Like, I think if you've got the, the, the wingers that we've had, we've had Nutterway out there, we've had Talia, um, Caleb Clark's had a, had a go. I think you wouldn't be losing anything if you said, well, Lester, your, your, your turn now. You're going to go out there and this is your opportunity. We're not sort of going backwards. If anything, this is why you were picked. You get a chance to go out there and perhaps get a start rather than coming off the bench. The most talked halfback, Cam Rawgard. Cam Rawgard. Do we see him? Do we, once again, do we, do we wait? We haven't... We've been looking for something different at halfback, and he hasn't had an opportunity to date. He's been in camp with them. Uh, this would be, you know, a big moment to put him in a big Test match. Uh, they've clearly got great faith in, in Finlay Christie. I, I think we all want to see him, but to your point, it's about putting that trophy away. But this, to me, is a great opportunity for some of these guys. If you want game changes, um, do we see Luke, Luke Jacobson? Here's another thing for you. Um, Jason Ryan was on the show last week. He talked about the fact there are players who are coming back from injury sure, yeah. who will come into the selection discussion. So all of a sudden, Ethan Blackadder, for example, I understand, is back out there. Now, here's a guy who can play multiple positions. We haven't even seen Luke Jacobson yet yeah. in an all-black jersey. He was one of the super rugby standouts. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. And, and you start going, what are the players that you go, we have to at least get a taste of to know that they have faith in them, or are we just no, going to stick you're, with the group? You're confusing me. There's too many people ah. to talk about. How many that's, so so let's go back to let's go back to Roy Gard. And I have a I have a passion for halfback Mills just because I like the contrast. I like, you know, TJ Perinar was amazing for us because you had you had Smith and then you had a different option with, with TJ coming on. Um, Roy Gard gives us that. So I think at some stage we have to see whether he can come on late in a game, be that extra loose forward, be a bit more aggressive. Does a dead a rubber tough. in Dunedin yeah. mm, prove anything? If it's a dead rubber. Now, I'm not, I'm not writing Australia off. I refuse to do no, that. Because no, yeah. then if it's not, right, say Australia win this Test match, Mills, Dunedin no, changes yeah. completely, yeah. significantly yeah. for the group, right? Because you're going, oh, I'm not taking any risks here. Yeah. There's a trophy on the line. But they would have they would have already had the fact if that happens, okay, if it does happen, touch what it doesn't, that we go over and win in Melbourne, that you know, those other guys that have played for the All Blacks A are now gonna be either the third sort of halfback coming, because he's not gonna get an opportunity, or they just say, look, well, regard goes. I would I don't see him playing. I'd love to see him playing in Melbourne, but I don't think so. There was that niggly period where, you know, Finlay Christie came on and he weathered that storm pretty well. He had, you know, the ball was messy, but that's experience, right? He's, he's been in there for a while. He's come off the bench. I don't think it's fair to give Roy Gard an opportunity to go out there and, and basically have messy ball. You want to give him as clean as, as cleaner stuff and let him sort of have a, have a clean ride. But at the same time, as well, well as I said, I probably contradict myself. Right, you know, right. can, he, can he handle the pressure? Take, take, can I just go back to another take point? An uncapped half back can I just go back to another point that you threw in quite casually, actually? So what you're saying, anyway. what you're saying to me is that guys are going to go to the World Cup and they haven't played for six months. For a long time. They're going to go and they, you'll, you'll be relying on them in the other games at the Rugby World Cup. Um, the Uruguays and Namibia, that's their impact that they can have. If Cam Roygaard gets selected, doesn't play in the next two tests, he won't have played since when did the Hurricanes get knocked out of Super Rugby? No, I'm talking about Blackadder. And... Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, another There are other guys yeah. that haven't been on the big stage. Unless they get a bit of NPC time, which starts next week. Quite possibly, yeah. That's kind of it. Anyway, well, after all of that, and as everyone's pondering, uh, we'll lighten things up a little. We love an inclusive game and an opportunity for everyone. And this week, we were able to sneak along and see a really special moment for one of New Zealand rugby's very special teams. Today we're celebrating 10 years of Falcons Rugby, so the New Zealand Falcons Rugby Club is a gain-inclusive uh, sports team that started in 2013. Our mission is to create a safe space for gay men, other members of the rainbow community, but also allies to play the game of rugby. I'd always taken for granted how inclusive rugby was. I'd always felt very included within my teams. And then getting involved in Falcons, I realised actually it was always very inclusive within the team, but maybe people on the outside didn't feel that same way. So it's amazing to be part of a team where it doesn't matter whether you're in the team or you're on the outside looking in, it's very inclusive and everyone feels welcome. Come on! Oh, 
it's, it, it's unbelievable. It's so much love, like I said at the start, just so much love. Everyone comes around, doesn't matter who you are, your sexuality, your identity, it's just love for whoever walks in the door, and it's amazing. They're a team of just wanting to try hard, you know, just just being out there for, and doing their thing. It's, it's a real joy and a privilege to play for them, you know. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm Falcon friendly all day. feeling to be out here you know it's we've 10 years of, of the Falcons we've grown we've had some troubles through COVID keeping that, that team going but the spirit of the team the committees that have come before us the players that have come before us it's just an amazing feeling to be out here today they are really supportive they're really caring and you feel included for their, this I have never even watched rugby I had no interest because of the yeah, masculine toxicity that sometimes comes out if I knew back in the 90s about the Falcons, it would have made a huge difference to my life, I think. Welcome back into Breakdown. We are well and truly on the countdown to Rugby World Cup 2023. Less than 50 days to go and it is with great pleasure we can welcome the Chairman of World Rugby, Sir Bill Beaumont, to join us on the show today. Welcome, uh, Sir Bill. Give us a sense. Less than 50 days. Obviously, there's been a bit of unrest in Paris. We've been watching it on the side of the world, the news. What's the sense of readiness uh, for France to host this tournament in just over a month? I think Vicky, I think uh, Ricky, that every one of them, uh, every one of us is excited. You know, I think the uh, the preparation's gone really well. All the venues are fantastic venues. And I think what we'll see on the field of play will be uh, fantastic at this World Cup because um, you're the experts who are all sat around that table far more than I am. But uh, I can see it's really too close to call. But preparations have gone well. Obviously, been been issues uh, around France. So now we can look forward to uh, an exciting World Cup starting in September. So, Bill, I saw you ring the uh, ballot lords the other day. That must have been exciting. Are they, they going to get through the last play or last game today, or looking a bit rough? It, um, I, it, was, it was actually at Old Trafford oh. uh, that. Uh, uh, in Manchester, where I rang the bell, that uh, I've got some family connections. My my uncle was the last amateur captain ever of the county cricket team there, so no, it was a great honour. Uh, hoping that we'll get a few hours in, but the the Aussies had a good day yesterday. Yeah, they 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 played well yesterday, so it'll take a bit to uh, to prize them out. But uh, great excitement here. And but what are your what are your hopes and aspirations technically from a rugby from an on field point of view for this World Cup that's coming up? Well, thanks, John. I think that when I when I look at it, I I think that excitement. I think sort of obviously not much controversy. Uh, hopefully, we look for for good play, open play, ball in play more. Uh, I think certainly there is a lot more excitement around it because nobody really knows deep down who's going to win it, and I think that is one of the great things about the World Cup of this year. I think uh, on the back of a fantastic World Cup that we had last year in, uh, in in New Zealand, I think we've also got an exciting World Cup coming up in uh, in 25 in England. Uh, I just think that that France, you played there, you know them. Jeff, you played them. Mills, you, you've all, you, all you guys have played there. There's something about rugby in, in a French stadium. I think the excitement that is generated there is uh, second to none. So, but what, with that in mind then, and the nature of the rugby, what, what are your expectations then of the refereeing group? What are you hoping for from that team of people in terms of their delivery on field? Well, I know that uh, they've been working diligently with uh, Joel Jouz, who's the uh, head of the referees. I know they had a, a winning camp. Uh, I think we can expect from the referees, look, referees are like players. Referees make mistakes. And, uh, you know, I think the, the way that uh, they are scrutinised makes it very, very difficult sometimes for them. Uh, because we all have an opinion, don't we? We all have an opinion. Uh, I just think that what we're aiming for is consistency. 
that's all you can ask for. Referee's consistencies uh, around the decision. I do think the the bunker where uh, yet yeah, reds and yellow cards will be referred to. I think that will help the referee. I think that will help the referee because you can imagine the pressure that a referee is under, that you're in a big stadium, you've got 80,000 people there, you've got yourself and you've got your three, two assistants and you've got a TMO in a shed and you're having to make a split second decision on uh, whether it's a, a yellow or a red. Now that is being taken out of their hands. You know, there'll be... Um, so around those decisions, I think there'll be consistency there as well. So that that's what we're that's what we're hoping, and that's what we're looking for. And I think as a player, that's all you can ask. You know, player player make mistakes, referee make errors. You know, it, it, that that is the part and parcel of our game of uh, rugby. So, Bill, you had me excited when you're saying there's only a few weeks to go or a month or so. And you started talking about referees, mate. So I've got to get you back on the excitement stage. 2019 most economically successful Rugby World Cup ever. Uh, you know, there was about 4.3 billion that, you know, sort of pounds, you know, that sort of was contributed to the economy there. When you sit back after 2023 and you fast forward, what does success look like off the field for, for Sir Bill, Bill Belmont? Well, I think what we'll, we have to look at, obviously, the product on the field is success. I think a vibrant game, more ball in play, attacking play. I think that is what the spectator wants to see. And I think the majority of players actually want to play that well, uh, I, I think. I think also finance, as you said, Mills, is really important because the global game can't survive without finance because at the end of the day, we are supporting competitions, we're supporting countries, we are supporting regions so that they can improve and expand the game. And that's exactly the same, whether it's for men and women, exactly the same. And if you think looking at the, we've also got an exciting um, WXV competition, which is being launched, you know, the, the first division down in New Zealand during, during the World Cup. Now that I think that will, that competition will also on the back of a World Cup that we successful last year, uh, I think that will really supercharge the the women's game even more than the World Cup did. But I want to get back to the to the referees. Some decisions over the weekend, especially the Michael Leach one in Japan, down here in the Southern Hemisphere, we've been having twenty minute red cards. And when you see a moment like Michael Leach, then didn't do it on purpose, but it did hit the head. You know, after 20 minutes of a red card, at least you can change the player and the fans don't suffer. I mean, did you go through that process and make the decision for the 20-minute card? And what were your thoughts on it? Look, we, we look at every decision that we make. We look at the unexpected consequences of making a decision. It has been debated at, at length, JK. It has been debated by... Uh, north and south of the, the equator. I think certainly the way we are at the moment, I think we have to ensure that accidents happen on the field. They're not intentional, but they are they are accidents. And the sort of, unfortunately, I haven't seen the Michael Leach incident. I haven't seen that m myself uh, personally, but, I, but I've seen other incidents, sort of World Cup finals, for instance, there. Um, in, in Auckland in, in November. You know, that was an accident. But we have to ensure the safeguard of our players, whatever we do. Uh, but I do think sort of going to this bunker, it does give the opportunity of a third party looking at whether it merited a red or a yellow card. I just want to ask you, Sibyl, about, and clearly it's, the big talking point for us has been the moment the pools come out and we see the potential quarterfinal matchups. And the top four teams in the world could quite easily meet in that quarterfinal based around seedings. Will there be a conversation post this Rugby World Cup about maybe when those um, seedings are made going into the next Rugby World Cup to maybe potentially avoid that situation? Absolutely, Jeff. You've hit it spot on. That when we, when we, when we look at it, sort of, well, the reason why the pool draws were made early is because the surety of the host cities and the hosts of knowing where teams are are going, which is quite quite very important, obviously, for 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 a tournament. 
but what we will be doing, we'll be looking to have the pool draw as late as possible so that you can get more consistency around the, the balance in a, in a pool. Because there's always going to be a one pool that is always going to be tougher than the others. You, you're always going to have, and look, I speak of experience of uh, chairing a, a host country that didn't get beyond the, the quarterfinals, you know, in, in 2015. So I know exactly what it's like to be sat around that table and looking and looking at a, at a pool draw. So what we will be doing, we, uh, we will be looking to see how late when we go to, to Australia that we can that we can make the pool draw. We're looking more and more, Bill, at a world game. So you're we're we're seeing the I don't know what we've got a name for it yet, but a, a sort of world club championship and then um, different competition from an international level. Do you see the two hemispheres working a lot closer through to the next World Cup? I, I think they are John. I think if you look at it, mate, that they uh, I think there's an enormous collaboration now between the two major uh, entities, i.e. the Six Nations and Sanzar, looking at wh whether how they can get closer together regarding uh, the, the Nations Cup. And I think the Nations Cup is something that will, it will happen. It definitely will happen. Uh, but we as World Red, we have to make certain that there is promotion and relegation in, into that so that we, we, we don't own the Six Nations competition. We don't own the Rugby Championship. But we can uh, control, not control, but sort of coerce and take people with us when it comes to the Nations Cup. And that's what we will be doing because we have to give the opportunity of countries who sit outside the, oh, the established tournaments. We have to give them opportunity to, to improve themselves. And so uh, a couple of months ago, I went to Spain, for instance. Spain has got a population of about 45 million people. It's an enormously successful sporting nation at team sports, and we've got to help them accelerate rugby in that country. Bill, just um, I was a little bit disappointed in, the, in World Rugby's decision around the sevens because I felt that sevens was a pathway for a lot of those nations you've just spoken about, Spain, Uruguay, those teams, but you've decided to cut it down to 12 teams. What was the, the, the major decision around that? Uh, the major decision around that is that obviously uh, we have to look at it as hosting tournaments and getting excitement within the stadium. And what we are doing, we are investing heavily in a regional competition, a tier two competition uh, for the uh, for the countries not in the uh, the regular um, So what we'll be doing, there will be competitions where there is promotion and relegation. So there will be a big playoff in... Uh, be a great occasion in uh, in Madrid at the Atletico Madrid Stadium, seventy five thousand people. Hopefully, we pack it out where there'll be promotion and rele relegation into into the tournament on an annual basis. Well, Sybil, I could sit and have another chat with you for sevens for a, a wee while longer, but we better let you go. Are you allowed to make a pick? Pick us a winner for the Rugby World Cup, or uh, or, or do you have to stay neutral? I've got to stay neutral, but I've been. I've been very impressed by your countrymen. I thought they, uh, the way in which they played for an hour against the Springboks, I thought was outstanding. But a uh, couple of big games coming up this weekend, actually. I'm quite looking forward to uh, to Melbourne. You know, I believe it's a sellout down there. So uh, my Australian mates were telling me it's, that it's, it's going to be sold out. So that'd be exciting to see, uh, see how Eddie gets on there. And um, look, I think the hosts are going to be strong, France. A lot of pressure on them. Ireland have had a great record. Yourselves, current world champions. You know, there's a lot of good countries down to, who will be playing in the World Cup. England are always dark horses in World Cup. Nobody ever gives them any chance, but they, uh, they always seem to do pretty well there. So, look, I think I think it could be one of the great World Cups. That's what we're that's what we're hoping for. Fun excitement player excitement, spectator excitement that helps accelerate the growth globally of our game. Well, Sir Bill, thank you so much uh, for joining us here on The Breakdown. All the very best to you and the World Rugby team getting everything ready for that tournament uh, coming up pretty soon in France. Thanks so much. OK, thank you. All the best.
I admire the uh, hope of no controversy at this Rugby World Cup. There was a couple of points uh, in, the, in our chat. Obviously, with the Bills are great to have him. We don't want to get into a referee bagging situation, but I guess that's one of the big concerns going into this competition, into the World Cup, that one or two big decisions change the course of the tournament. Mills, you did a game yesterday, Samoa, Japan, that had some moments that possibly highlight some of the issues we're talking with Sibyl too. Yeah, certainly did. And that's you're right, we don't want to get to the Rugby World Cup and be talking about a controversial moment that wins, you know, the William Webb Alice, you know, and that's what we know. So we mentioned the fact there's a bunker. So it's the foul play review officer that they're going to use. They haven't impl implemented that what yet. What the hell happened since I've been gone? <laughs> what is a bunker? Yeah, well, it's not even the bunker. asking for it? What is a bunker? I don't get a bunker. One. I've never heard of a bunker. Yeah, I know what the NRL one is, but we've got TMOs. What's a bunker? So it's... So it's the foul play review officer. That's basically separate from it's they're separate from from the TMO. So if there was a red card it's yellow. A, or yellow card, sorry, and they've gone off, the referee can now, who is the sole judge of whatever happens, review that now to the foul play review officer. They have eight minutes to have a look at it and see whether it's upgraded to a red card. And if it's a red card, then obviously that rule comes in where they cannot return back to the field. Can I just say that? My, my problem, let's leave the referees alone. And one of the reasons I, I asked Bill about the 20-minute red card is because if you look at that Michael Leach thing, um, incident, it was, for me, a red card. It's reckless, here it is, bomb. It's reckless. So but again, the fans should more, not suffer. So what's happening now is we're going to go to a separate bunker. So, what, so the TMO goes to a bunker and then the bunker says... You're off anyway. What? I think for this incident, it's a, it's a pure red card. The thing that I had concern about it, it took them an age to realise whether it was a, to come to the decision that it is a red card. So once he's off, he's gone. It's a red card. They can't replace him. When it becomes a little bit sort of iffy, they're obviously going to give him a, a yellow card, right? And he gets the opportunity to go off. They review it, and whilst they're reviewing it, the review officer comes back later on. The game keeps going. We're not which stopping. Is important, which We're is not. One of the we're, we're not stopping, OK? And that's the important part. They haven't started implementing that. And that was probably the concern, you know, yesterday's game, that there were so many stoppages. The TMO was coming in for every little wee thing. And so how is the referee going to referee? And, and I suppose once they get this going, it might speed things up like Sir Bill Beaumont's wanting. Well, this is my problem, right? Because I, I don't think there's foul play anymore. Like, Michael Leach is one of the loveliest guys you meet off the field. There's no way he would have wanted to do that. That's why the 20-minute car. But, but if you listen to some of this, we're going we're gonna to play you some stuff with. The referees have got so much pressure. Yeah. With the TMO in their ear, I like the way that NRL have gone. The referee calls it, then they go to the bunker or whatever we're going to call it. Well, let's, yeah, let's listen to it. Cause, so this is the, this test match that we're talking about and the, and the yeah. TMO chatting check, away. Check, check. Sorry? Check, check. Time off. Time off. Time off. I, I want to show you an eye tackle by six blue. OK, TMO. Neck hole red. Neck hole red. So to clear, there's two separate situations here. So the first clip there that you, you heard... Breathe, John. He, he, the, the, am I right, Mills, and you did this game? So he actually went back five, six, seven phases yeah. to show that one, whereas the neck... neck I'll do neck roll one... Uh, is more that he called that live. He, he's made the call as the referee live. Is he that how it played out? And considering what sort of happened, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the first one. You know, they they, they stopped play, so stay, play had already sort of gone. They've come back and reviewed it again. They've taken an age to get that sorted. Yellow card gone off. Okay, the next one is actually with about thirty seconds to go, and he's actually called it live. Japan were only down by two. If they get a penalty, then they can possibly slot it and, and win the game. Listen to this. He's he's calling it straight away. Neck hole red. Neck and so who's refereeing red. the game? Is it is it the guy on the, yeah, on the pitch my, or is he listening? My, my problem totally with that, Goldie, my problem with that is Michael Leach I get and I, I think they should come back and I hope that bunker works out. But that is a 50-50 call that no TMO should come on. Oh. If you have a look at that, that is not a neck roll. And that's where they've got it wrong. You cannot, in the final play of a World Cup final, Can you stop... That? the game in case in case it's not quite right. You've got one angle, instantaneously the TMO has decided that's the end of the game. So if you're in the stands and that's the game and you're sitting there going, what just happened? 
Uh, and you don't get a replay. You don't get an opportunity to sit again and look at it. And you, you don't, don't hear the TMO You don't say... hear the TMO. It's just play on, and then if there's a situation you need to go back to, you know, because that's the final moment of a game. That would be the worst outcome. This is not the rest, court. by the way, people at home, because I was away, um, you know, when Ben got all that that abuse online, which absolutely dis was disgraceful. It's not their fault. My problem, and, and I think Bill mentioned him, as Joel George is the boss, they're following a protocol. It's the protocol that's wrong. The TMO needs to stay out of it unless the ref calls them or unless it's foul play. Well, apparently how, that, can you, how can you deal with that in your Apparently that was foul play. Like, that's so marginal for me. And I can get it when it's clear and obvious. Like, when it's a clear and obvious, and it's certainly a case where it's put a player in danger. But I look at that and go, if that's the way we expect their game to be decided, and the Michael Leach one for me, I'll just give you a quick one there. We're going to see this. It's going to happen in this Rugby World Cup across a number of games he swore in 2019 in Japan. That's, that's what's going to be 20 minutes. It's going to be the expectation. It is just going to be the way it is. But you, you notice through the course of that tournament that they start, when they realised for a start yeah. there were cards everywhere. I think they will slowly soften, but we're going to see it. You're going to have to prepare yeah, for it. Yeah, I get it. it, but this is my problem with the 20 minute, not having the 20 minute red card. Because why, if the player's been ill disciplined, he should suffer, he should go off and stay off. Why should we suffer? And why should a massive campaign, be it from Australia, New Zealand, yeah. or South Africa, suffer around a, 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 a set of decisions that I think are wrong? And the reality is, is there's discrepancies between how the North and how the South referee and interpret all of these things. And we aren't getting a 20-minute red card and we're going to keep going on, but I think you're right. It's, it's poor play, not foul play, that is getting red carded. It's the but, fan thing for me, yeah, Ricky, yeah, yeah. is the fact that you're in the stadium. You've yeah, not wired up to a TMO. Yeah. You don't know. So the referee's the guy who looks as though he's made the decision, but it isn't. It's someone in a, looking at a TV screen. I don't think that works for me. And a tightly really contested Rugby World Cup, like he's saying, so many teams can win it. And, you, and red card happens in the first 10 minutes, that's ruined the game. You know, when teams are so close, that's what you don't want. You want someone to be able to come back on after a red card. I agree. So. Well, we've also got to put onus on players to get things right as well, though, too. Um, let's have a break. Let's have a, a rest. And we're actually going to go back, uh, back to Europe after the break, and we're going to catch up, get some insight from the France camp with their assistant coach, Sean Edwards. Stay with us on The Breakdown. She's still going, Church. Will anyone stop her? She's still going. She's over. Excellent women's special. Was the pass he got in the way? Here's Tanga. Tanga drawing in the defenders. Got the pass away. Right to Kelly. Steps away. Scores the try. Operator Wilson Brittina Patali stands a little kick through. Going to sit up nicely for Colossi, who dies low. There was actually some rugby played over the weekend instead of us just wiring on about it. Farah Palmer Cup Round 2. What an absolute banger. 27-24. Waikato beating defending champions Canterbury. That was an extra time golden point penalty winning that one. Counties Monaco, they had the bye round one. Poor old Bay of Plenty. Difficult start for the Volcanics. And then uh, Otago in the championship division getting up over Tasman the first game in the championship. Manawatu relegated da back down to the championship and might be on their way back up after that. Tough old start for Taranaki, 84-0. Good win for Northland and then Auckland after being beaten by one last week, getting up over Wellington, 17-15. Auckland on the board after two rounds of the Farah Palmer Cup. Right, we're going to continue our international flavour on the show tonight and the build-up to Rugby World Cup. And it is a real pleasure to head into the French camp and have their assistant coach, Sean Edwards, join us. Sean, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Less than 50 days now. What sort of things are you doing? Is it down to detail and nitty-gritty at this stage of preparation? Um, we, we just have two weeks of very hard training in, uh, in Monaco. Uh, in the heat of the afternoon, etc. So the guys got really pushed hard. Um, we also did some some good rugby formations as well. So um, we know having a week, we've got a couple of weeks preparation before our first uh, kind of warm up game against Scotland. So uh, we'll probably go into a bit more detail rugby wise. 
Um, but it's still it's still an emphasis on fitness, you know. Obviously, we're very aware that, you know, you guys in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, at this time of year, you're, you know, pretty battle-hardened. You know, you're playing some amazing rugby down there as well. Uh, we have to sort of try to make up with that because it's the start of the season for us when the World Cup starts. So, you know, and obviously to do that, you have to be try to be, get as fit as possible, really. John, real honour, a real honour for me uh, tonight having you on the show, mate. My dad absolutely idolised you, uh, Wigan legend, over 500 games. I uh, remember coming to watch you uh, play for the for the British Lions down here against the Kiwis. Amazing uh, what you did with your own career, but it's amazing how you've actually, uh, you know, transformed into one of the world's leading defence coaches. But my question, mate, is there's going to be five of your league colleagues at the Rugby World Cup as defence coaches. Are you still learning from Rugby League? Is Rugby League still where the defence is coming from, the new stuff coming from, or are you just making your own stuff up? Um, well, obviously, at the breakdown, it's, it doesn't come from Rugby League, no. Um, but, you know, certain tackle techniques, etc. You're always trying to learn, always trying to improve yourself. Well, uh, I certainly am anyway. And, uh, you know, even from things like NFL, you look at the, you know, how, how the, you know, the, the power of the tackle in the NFL and stuff like that. So anything you can learn from, you know, you're more than willing to do that. And I just want to say thank you for letting me on a, on a, any programme called The Breakdown. <laughs> Trust me, I'm in. I'm in straight away, mate. <laughs> a rugby-loving person like myself, whether it's league or union, Mate, an event called The Breakdown, I'm, I'm straight in there, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Sean, I know you mentioned before tackle technique, and we've already sort of had it, you know, red cards, yellow cards, that can have a massive impact. I mean, in terms of the defence, how, how, how do you train that? Because it's a fast, physical game. You want to stop the offload. Do you touch on that a little bit with your, with yeah. your players, or is it about just going out there and, and just hitting hard? No, no. It's to practice, 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 you know. Um, obviously, um, <clears throat> there's a big emphasis on uh, leg tackling at the moment. Um, it's some we we practice a lot uh, because we do have very very good jacklers, people who can get in and steal the ball afterwards. And um, the the great thing about rugby union is it's it's a, it's a it's a contest for the ball. I think it's a really really positive uh, um, part of rugby, uh, rugby union, is that there's always a contest for the ball, and uh, long may that continue. Sean, we always talk about mental preparation. I'm interested in. in is that part of your delivery in terms of a defensive mindset? Because I didn't have a defensive mindset at any point in the game. <laughs> Wasn't interested in that side of it when I was playing. But is that part of the way that you deliver to your group? Is it different from an attacking mindset? Um, not really. I just think it's the, the ability to be able to switch your, 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 your head and switch your body in, into, you know, we've got to tackle that because... Like I said, like I've just said before, the great thing about rugby union is that there could be a very quick changeover of possession. One minute you've got the ball, and the next second you're not because you've been turned over the rook or counter rook, etc. And you have to have that immediate reaction of getting into defensive formation because obviously you've lost the ball, or get into attacking formation because you've just won the ball at the rook. So that's a, a huge, huge part of the game. Sean, obviously, um, a lifetime in the Northern Hemisphere, you often refer to the Southern Hemisphere, but we've seen this incredible improvement from the Northern Hemisphere right across the game in the last probably five to ten years. France would probably be one of the favourites going into the World Cup. What do you think has been the difference between hemispheres from your point of view? Um, the big difference is that you usually win the World Cup. <laughs> 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 You know, you look at New Zealand, won it three times, South Africa three times, Australia twice, and England once. So we've only had one win up here. So, you know, we, we, we have to pull our socks up, we have to improve, and we have to try to emulate uh, the great feats of the, of the great Southern Hemisphere teams. And, uh, you know, obviously, with it being at home for us, that, that's, uh, you know, a little bit of an advantage, I, I would have thought. Um, you know, you guys would know about that in 2011, obviously, that, which was my first World Cup. Um, but as I said, you know, before, you know, the standard bearers, particularly at World Cups, have always been the Southern Hemisphere teams. Well, talk to us about that then, Sean. 
First game up against the All Blacks. You're leading into it. You're in Monaco. I'd love to be in Monaco right now, I'll tell you that. But what's the focus for the French at the moment? Is it oh, about getting the right team to play the All Blacks in that very first game, or are you just sort of making your way through the tournament? Because it's a very long tournament. Yes, it is a very long time, and, and, and sometimes, particularly in the north, uh, you know, very long preparation as well, you know. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons that we're back at home at the moment, back with our families, uh, having a, a week's break, because, it, it you know, I, I understand you guys in, in, the, in the south have a lot of travel, you know, um, particularly at the end of the seasons when you come up up north sometimes. So it's, it's important to get, to get some family time in as well. But, yes, I do, I do feel that... You know, we have to get as fit as possible because you guys are really battle aren't you, when you when when you come for cuts to the World Cups. Sean, we could uh, sit and chat for for the rest of the show, but we better let you go and continue on the rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining us. All the very best to you and the team for your preparations ahead. And we cannot wait uh, for that opening game in, in just uh, what a month or so's time. Thank you so much. Like I said, any 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 sport. Uh, Event called Breakdown. I'm in there. Just get me in. <laughs> Thanks, George. Oh, we've won over the uh, the French team. Uh, we've rented and raved so much. We've just about got to get out of here. So, Bleeders Low Cup uh, Saturday night. Picks, JK. What oh, are you all blacks. Well, yeah, but how much? He doesn't care. Doesn't I don't care. care. <laughs> yeah, doesn't I should, care. I've done this You're show enough, care. and I should know. You know I think I think I think Australia would be very good. Yeah, I think they'd be very good, at the Aussies. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing the All Black side continue that momentum. Some uh, be interesting. Some uh, selection issues, Chief. Chief. Oh, a comfortable win. We'll dominate. Oh. Yep. We'll dominate. Uh, we'll continue on our way, Ricky. I think uh, we've taken that step up. I think they'll, it'll be tough for them to stay with us. Okay, I'll go All Blacks win, and I'm going to go a football ferns three 0 over the Philippines uh, as well uh, on Tuesday for Football World Cup as well. Uh, we'll see you next week. Enjoy your week of footy. The Wallabies v the All Blacks. And now the All Blacks looking to execute. Kapkiaho, Kapkiaho, infield for try number two. Spin over to Barrett, Moonga, Richie Moonga. Barrett in the line, see space in behind, and finds Jordan, who cuts to the outside, and then explodes away. Selfie goes well, and now finds Kelly on the he won't be denied this time. Away for Callaway, looking for the tyre. Callaway! He goes in again! Here we go! And final effort. Can they hang on? Jordan. Crossfield Jordan. Away for Barrel Trial Bucks. Wallaby's hearts broken.